Hi, welcome to This Week in Ames. I'm Susan Guiazda. On today's show, we'll check in with the Water and Pollution Control Department. Today, my guest is John Dunn, Water and Pollution Control Director for the City of Ames. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Susan. Well, you've had a busy last couple of weeks. Uh, we're wrapping up the flood mitigation study. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that study and where we are in the process. Well, the, the whole purpose of the study, uh, you know, of course, it stems from the floods of 2010. And uh, it was driven by uh, the council's desire to, to better understand what the causes were and what types of mitigation actions could be taken to minimize the impact of future flooding, knowing there's nothing that we're gonna be able to do that can completely eliminate flooding. But what can we do to minimize uh, the frequency and when it does happen help minimize the impact so that's really what the study was going after and we began this process sometime in uh, last fall yeah we did start last fall and uh, they started initially with doing uh, updated modeling doing the hydraulic and hydrologic modeling uh, to help generate the maps and then uh, from that then most of this late winter early spring uh, was spent modeling different alternatives, mitigation alternatives, and, and then being able to compare one alternative to another, both in terms of its effectiveness at, at mitigating the impacts of flooding and then also looking at the cost-benefit analysis as well. So the city worked closely with the consultant HDR on this, yeah. and they looked at um, what I thought was so interesting is that they took existing storms and sort of superimposed them over Ames and looked at what might have happened. Right. One of the things we did not want to do was to have the entire study be a look in the rearview mirror and only be modeling for events we've already seen. Uh, and so we wanted some, some measure in the study of trying to evaluate how bad could it get. Um, and we talked about a lot of theoretical things we could have done, some extrapolation of trend lines or assumptions about changes in dew point. Uh, but it, it really felt really theoretical and hypothetical and um, we felt it was going to make it difficult for people to really grasp it and feel like it was a meaningful conclusion. So instead what they did, this was really interesting, is they took five storm events that have happened in the last five years in Iowa, some extreme rainfall events, and they took them and through their modeling they superimposed that rainfall event on our basin. And they were able to say, okay, what if that storm that happened in 2011 in Dubuque actually happened on top of us? And it, it feels much more real. You know, it's a storm event that actually happened. And I think it really does give some perspective to what, what the possible extent of flooding is we could see here. So you took that Dubuque storm and you looked at if it had gone a little bit to the west and had uh, rained in our uh, basin, what would have happened to actual property here in Ames? Uh, well, the, the impact varied depending on where you were in the basin. There were some areas that didn't see much of an impact at all, and there were other areas that saw flood depths uh, several feet deeper than what we saw. Um, for example, one location that sticks in my mind is in south, on the South Duff Business District. Uh, that area could have seen floodwaters maybe as high as six feet higher than what we saw in 2010. It's pretty amazing. That's significant. Another important part of this whole flood mitigation study was the public input component. Uh, there were a lot of different ways to get people involved in the study. Yeah, there was. We, we held a series of public meetings at three different points through the study. Um, well attended. We had uh, about 150 people, I think, come uh, to those meetings, maybe even more than that. Um, of course, we were doing all of the Facebook and Twitter notifications, as you know, um, press releases, a lot of the conventional media. Uh, and then we also had on the city's website uh, an online public meeting uh, where anybody who couldn't come to the in-person meetings could go and they could see the same information that was being presented uh, in an online meeting format. And we got really good feedback on that idea of I can't actually physically be present at the meeting so I'm going to go online and see the meeting and leave comments. Yeah, and it generated hundreds and hundreds of comments, which did play a significant role in shaping the way many of the alternatives were evaluated. So um, we've been working with the consultant, we've got public input. Where are we now in the process? Uh, well, in April, the, the consulting team kind of presented their final evaluation of the alternatives to the city council. Uh, what they're working on right now is to finalize the written report and as a part of that written report there's one final alternative combination that they're going to look at for the City Council and it's blending together some of the, 
the most cost-effective elements of several of the individual alternatives uh, into a single uh, strategy so that we can look at a combination of what would be upstream slowing down the flow, uh, some physical protection in Ames, and a little bit of being able to speed up water once it gets here. Um, so it, it kind of balances, I think, the concerns of people upstream asking don't slow down the water and people downstream saying don't speed it up. Uh, we're doing a little bit at both ends on either side of the city to help offset each other and then looking at some physical protection here in the city. And while um, solutions are being identified, we should also um, you know, make a point of saying we haven't um, identified necessarily funding for these solutions yet. We, we haven't. and. Um, while there were, are some of them that are more cost effective than others, they are all expensive. Mm -hmm. There are really no cheap, low hanging fruit here. Uh, some of the least expensive alternatives were in the range of six to $10 million. Uh, the most expensive alternative that the consulting team looked at actually exceeded $1 billion. So like a lot of things, uh, we will take these a uh, step at a time as we go forward. Right, yeah, the, the consulting team will have their final report that we will be presenting back to the council probably in June or July. Um, and then uh, with conversation with council, then we will develop this into a, a longer term strategy that will be implemented into the capital improvements plan. Great. Well, I know that's not the only big thing you have going on. You also are in the process of building a new water treatment plant. We are. Yeah, that's, that's getting really exciting. That's been a, a busy, busy activity this spring. Uh, we just uh, recently had our 40% design workshop with the consulting team, uh, which means at this point in time, the walls are pretty much done moving in the floor plan. Uh, the treatment elements are all fairly well established, and now we're starting the transition into actually preparing the construction plans, the, all the construction details. Um, and so that, that's going to continue uh, through the rest of calendar 2013. Uh, probably early 2014, we're going to be ready for a notice to bidders on the project. So we're standing here in front of the existing water treatment facility, which is over 80 years old. It parts is. Parts of it. Yes, parts of it. It was uh, the oldest portions were constructed in 1924. And the new facility is located? Uh, the new facility is going to be on uh, East 13th Street, just on the east side of the river, south side of the street. And because of its location, we're able to reuse some uh, infrastructure. Yeah, there's, there's several million dollars worth of infrastructure at the site we're at right now that's going to be able to be remu reused. Uh, in particular, we've got two ground storage reservoirs that uh, combined hold about 7 million gallons of finished water. And then also our high service pump station at this facility will continue to operate into the future. So if we could fly, we'd be about a mile, a mile and a half east? Probably right about a mile okay. east of where we are right now. So not too far away? No, not, not too far. And one last thing before you go, as we're getting into the warmer months, um, we always try to remind our residents about conserving water. Yeah, yeah. the, the message that we want folks to think about um, is, is spring comes and then turns into summer and it starts getting warm, uh, is to just be smart about the way that they're irrigating. You know, we, we don't tell people don't irrigate, but we ask them to be smart about that. And, and by smart, we mean, um, you know, thinking about how much water they're putting on the lawns. You know, one good measure is that if you have water ponding and running down your driveway or your sidewalk, um, you're not going to grow any more concrete regardless of how much you water it. Uh, but generally, a, a healthy, well-established lawn only needs an inch of water per week. And uh, the easiest way to know when you've done that is to just take a little bathroom cup out, set it in your yard when you're running the sprinkler, and when you've filled the bathroom cup, you've put enough water on your lawn for the week. Well, everything is green now. We've had a very wet spring, but of course we've had that in the past and summer gets dry and maybe a little brown and people feel this need to constantly water. And it really doesn't help the lawn, does it? Um, no, actually it's better for a lawn, again, talking about a healthy, well-established lawn, to actually allow it to go dormant um, and, and to cut, begin cutting back on the watering as the weather warms up. That actually encourages the roots to go deeper as the, as the lawn searches for that water and that deeper rooted grass is much more able to withstand a drought uh, when it happens. Uh, I was able to take advantage of the Smart Water, Smart Water Sids program and get a rain barrel. My rain barrel is nice and full right now, which is a great way to water your landscaping. Yeah, it is. Um, and it, it helps in localized flooding issues, helps prevent runoff. 
uh, helps prevent the transfer of fertilizers and nutrients off of properties and into the rivers. It's a really great solution. So if people are interested in getting a rain barrel, we have those uh, forms on our website and that's a $50 cost share program. Yep, that's the best place to go find them is on the website. Well, John, I'm glad you were able to stop by. You got a lot of stuff going on. It's always good to talk to you. Yeah, glad to talk. Well, as we get into the month of May, remember that May 15th is the last day to get those discounted Fermit and Aquatic Center season passes. You can get those by going to the community center or by calling them to get more information. As we get closer to June, the Ames Municipal Band will kick off their series of free municipal band concerts on Thursdays through the summer. Those start at 7 o'clock with the pre-concert and with the Ames Municipal Band taking the stage at 8 p.m. Those are always held at Ames Bandshell Park and go on rain or shine. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for watching and tune in next week for This Week in Ames.